I have a lot harder time getting my materials for my work than probably a lot of artists do. I don't have the luxury of being able to go into a craft store and put some things in my basket. Um, a lot of my materials are donated to me, but then I don't really have a choice with what to work with either, so I make use of what comes my way. My name is Serena Brewer and I do taxidermy related sculptures out of uh, taxidermy related materials and organic animal materials. Rogue taxidermy, it is a form of fine art and it's a genre that utilizes some of the materials that taxidermists use but not necessarily all the materials, just taxidermy related materials. It can be abstract, it can be conceptual, it doesn't have to be necessarily figurative or even look at it like an animal, the end product. It's really a lot broader than I think a lot of people realize. Growing up, animals always played a central role in our family with lots of family pets, and we had a little animal graveyard outside of our family home, and that continued the tradition. I don't consider myself religious, but I really relate to St. Francis, patron saint animals. I think of all of my work as a tribute or an homage to the animal. So these deer skulls that I found in the woods that I hang in a tree, the squirrels come and chew on those just for the calcium. So it's kind of interesting little circle of life. I have a collection of natural history objects that started when I was probably in about second or third grade that's grown over the years. So my dining room has kind of turned into like a parlor or gallery area where I house all of these objects and artifacts. Twitted squirrels, the very first thing I ever did, I kept them kind of the same reason why a bar keeps their very first dollar and staples it to the wall. So I've hung on to him for all these years because he's the very first one. All my animals are ethically sourced. This has been a primary directive of mine, and all my animals have to be not killed for the purpose of art. So it's all about recycling. Most of the animals I get are donated to me. This Capricorn that I did is one of the very first pieces that I did that was inspired by mythology. And this also was inspired by my mother's works. My mother did fantasy art when I was growing up. I do have like several different work in several different veins, mostly as a way to try to use as many parts of the animal as possible because that's really important to me. So I do the hybrid creatures that are kind of either from imagination or ones that are kind of based loosely on mythology. The gilded mummies, which I've been doing since I was at MCAD, and then also esodermy, where you're just looking at the underlying muscle of the animal and the, the skeletal structure. Those different mediums that I'm working with really exemplify how diverse rogue taxidermy actually is. I've been here in my home for 19 years now. I have neighbors, two neighbors actually, that are urban chicken ranchers, and um, one set of those neighbors has given me several birds that I've incorporated into sculptures. Hey guys. Hi Serena. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good, what happened? A little cold snap. A little cold snap. Oh, bummer, well thanks for saving her for me. Yeah, no problem. Serena's our neighbor, we've known her seven years, and we've probably been giving her chickens about Four years, maybe? Three, four years. We always lose a couple when it gets really cold if they're older. Pretty amazing that we can give her a chicken and then all of a sudden it's a griffin. Great, good to see yeah. you. Talk <laughs> soon, bye-bye. Taxidermy does not involve any blood and guts, ideally. Sometimes you, you might slip and puncture through something, but in a perfect world, just taking the skin off of the underlying carcass. And now we're just kind of left with 
just the skin of the squirrel, and this, this point is when I would put it into the tanning bath. It preserves it is what it does, and it sets the hair into the skin so it won't fall out. So it's basically, it's leather with fur still on it. For this project, when you mount a bird, you actually need to keep the skull. Well, like with modern taxidermy, actually the head is part of a, like a urethane mannequin. A lot of my techniques I use are kind of just old school techniques. So I'm using this um, borax, kind of a salt-like mineral that has antimicrobial properties and it preserves the skin. Yeah, I think in order to make a convincing creature, you have to have an understanding of the way an animal works. And I've always been interested in anatomy. So I think that really helps a lot and comes into play with my work. These are taxidermy mannequins used for traditional taxidermy. Just for an example, this is a twitted rat. What's underneath him is something that basically looks like, looks like this right here. And then the skin will go over it. So that's how we're gonna be assembling the project that I'm gonna be putting together. This part right here is a satisfying part of the process. Seeing it come together, going from something that's just in my head, an idea, into a three-dimensional object. The most rewarding part about being an artist is when people understand what you're trying to get across, which is really difficult when you're using the medium that I'm using. When you're a painter, or a sculptor and you're doing something figurative, people look at it and they kind of understand what you're doing. But when you're using an animal to try to get a point across, it's a lot trickier. So if people stand there long enough and actually think about those aspects of it, and when they understand that it's also done out of reverence for the animal, that's the most rewarding part for me.